Our featured BBB Wise Giving Alliance accredited charity seal holders for this episode are MAP International, Mercy Ships, National Eczema Foundation. To find out more about these and other BBB Wise Giving Alliance accredited charities, go to give.org. You're listening to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor. Powered by BBBGive.org. Here we explore the motivations that form the basis of giving and service. We inspire generosity and celebrate the transformative effects that giving and service have on the human spirit and on community. The conversations featured on the podcast also uncover giving strategies that educate and provide tools to help listeners make impactful gifts of both their time and money. We hope you enjoy this episode. This is the Heart of Giving podcast, powered by BBBGive.org. Give.org is the nation's standards-based charity evaluator, and it's your one-stop source for information on giving and reports on the most asked about charities. I'm Art Taylor. You know, we've done a number of episodes focused on diversity, equity, inclusion, and access, and how it plays out particularly in nonprofit organizations, and even how people who support organizations think of the trustworthiness of groups that engage in that type of behavior. But in more recent days, especially since I would argue the heyday of our focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion activities after the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, we've seen organizations begin to push back, or at least there's been a perception that DEI efforts are on the decline in some places. And I'm not sure that's true, but I thought it was worth having a discussion with someone in the field who works in DEI every day and just sort of get a better understanding of where we are with these efforts. And that individual is my colleague at Columbia University School of Professional Studies, Erwin De Leon, PhD. And Erwin is the Chief Diversity Officer of the School of Professional Studies. He's also a lecturer in the discipline of nonprofit management. He's a research fellow, canology, member of the Empire State Bioethics Consortium. And Erwin, I'll also say, has done amazing work in the nonprofit sector for many years. He was a research associate at the Urban Institute's Metropolitan Housing and Communities Policy Center and also the Center on Philanthropy there. He is interested in a wide range of issues in nonprofit organizations, considering groups like the Human Rights Campaign, Episcopal Relief and Development, Educators for Social Responsibility, Metropolitan Museum of Manila. And he is just a tremendous friend and colleague, and I'm great to have him here on the show today. Thank you, Erwin, for joining us. And so, Erwin, just welcome again to the Heart of Giving podcast. Well, thank you for having me, Art. Glad to be here. So, Erwin, on this theme that I'm raising I'm really curious to get your sense of things about DEI and the practice, I guess, is one way of describing it. Those in the profession who are trying to move our society to be more inclusive and equitable and diverse for that matter. What are we seeing? Are we seeing changes in sort of the commitment to it in any way? What are we seeing? I think it depends on who you talk to, right, and uh, the location of these folks. And I know there have been a lot of articles, if you will, or even anecdotes about the backlash and people are retrenching or what have you. But the fact of the matter is I haven't come across like a definitive study that's really seen how many DI jobs have been lost in a whole, right? So if we were to just look even in the nonprofit sector or in the corporate sector or what have you. So I actually would say that 
has there been some backlash or, if you will, some retrenchment due to the affirmative action ruling uh, from the Supreme Court? To some degree, um, there has been. But I don't believe that DEI is dead. I think there are those who would be happy to say that, but I'd argue it isn't. And if you just look uh, in the corporate sector in particular, where the numbers are better, where people actually track the numbers, and you look at DEI beyond the U.S., I think that's another thing. So you have to look, are we talking about the entire U.S.? Are we talking about particular states? Are we talking about the entire world? So no surprise, clearly, if you look at Florida, and other states where they have banned DEI, sure, it, you, you can feel the effects there and people have lost their jobs. But across the country, and I'd say across the world, DEI is far from dead. Well, that's good to know. So, but we do hear, see these things in places like Florida and it definitely concerns us, right? When we can see that there is a concerted effort, it seems, to produce a backlash and to um, have some of the more important initiatives undermined by these ways of looking at things. What do we have to say about that? Well, I I think there's uh, folks definitely have a reason to be concerned, right? And I'm not saying that we should be complacent about it. Far from it. And as you well know, a number of folks in our sector, both the foundations and nonprofits, and I'm not a lawyer, so that's why I'm careful uh, not to give any legal advice. But uh, folks have been saying that, yeah, practitioners in our field, both nonprofit practitioners and those in philanthropy, should really be on the lookout, right, and be aware not to stop necessarily at this point, but be aware and be ready. Like, how are you going to respond? And I think this is where, you know, I know the Council on Foundations and other nonprofit lawyers have uh, given advice, right, of what to look out for. And ultimately, as you know, we talk about ethics in nonprofit sector, obey the laws. So I think it's going to be state specific. So if you're in one of the, well, there are now eight, I have my numbers in front of here, there are eight laws in across Idaho, North Dakota, Utah, Texas, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Florida. We only talk about Florida. But those other states have anti-DI bills. And that's where I think while that's where our fellow practitioners really have to see and like how what are the implications for them. So it's very state specific in my mind and seeing what's going on. Well you know I, I kind of have this feeling about the whole field, which is ultimately we want institutions, state governments, businesses, nonprofits, what have you, to just let us know who they are. And then maybe the marketplace can sort of decide what they want to do with that. My basic belief, Erwin, is that you're not really going to scale and be successful if you're not inclusive, creating access and opportunities for people regardless of their background. I just don't think it's scalable to avoid this area. And yet people are, and that's what they want to do. They can do that. But I think the marketplace is going to have something to say about that. I wouldn't have thought about that. Well, it already has. The marketplace already has. And, you know, studies uh, have shown from data from corporations from the for-profit side and McKinsey and Deloitte and others have done amazing studies on this. So the business case for DEI has been proven. And even after the ruling, affirmative action ruling, nothing's changed, right? So you're absolutely right that the market will have an impact in the sense that, A, doing good. And in this case, uh, practicing DEI is actually good for business, number one. And number two, also demographic changes, not just in the U.S., but globally. So for instance, one demographic group would be millennials and younger who expect places that are more diverse, equitable, and inclusive, right? So I think, and that's why I'm not, that's why I remain hopeful, at least when we're talking about nationally and globally, that DEI is not going to die. Things are changing. It's far. But that's not to say that there might be some places where they will fight that, right? And that's where, yeah, there will always be a tension even. And and I question like how much the marketplace can necessarily dictate it, let's say in places like Florida and others. But I guess we won't really know 
until a few years from now, right? Like folks are quick. I, I'm wary of those who prognosticate and give their ideas right after, like it's only been a few months <laughs> and we don't even really know how this law will develop, how the new laws are going to play out in certain places. So yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. The marketplace will have a say in this. Do you feel that we're actually making progress inside of institutions? And, you know, take your own for an example. Are we making progress, Erwin? <laughs> now, <laughs> just for the record, I'm not, this is not a reflection necessarily on the university I'm working for. <laughs> no, I, I'm kidding. No, but seriously, I think... It, it's one of those uh, observing from where I sit and others uh, talking to other folks who practice DEI, right, as leaders in the field. It seems like those the usual three steps forward, two steps back. Okay. So has there been change? Absolutely. The fact that there are offices and that there are places, both nonprofits, for profits that have chosen to support and keep their DEI initiatives. So yes, but that said, I still think we have a long way to go to achieving the ideals of DEI or what, at least to me, it's supposed to be, right? Because I know you didn't ask this, but I think one issue, just having done this now here at Columbia for three years and listening to other folks, I think we conflate those three letters, DEI. Those are three different things, right? Yeah. And I think that's where if you will, the confusion or the tension or what have you, because folks have different understandings yeah. of what DEI is. And even preparing for for, for this conversation, I, you know, I, I just had to look back at my notes and, and just in myself, because for me, DEI is really, yes, it's based in the organization, right? It's practicing with, it's, it's practicing DEI in organization would mean looking at policies, practices, procedures that ensure that the organization is diverse and that folks feel that they belong, right? They're treated equitably, particularly those who belong to this day, disadvantaged groups. But I think we forget, at least to my mind, DEI exists because it started with this desire to address historical inequities in the country, right? Because you can trace this whole, the whole DI movement, if you will, before it became, before it was called DI to affirmative action. Yeah. And that's my concern because right now what's happening too is there's some folks like, okay, maybe one way we can address the situation is let's not talk about the D, right? Let's not even talk about the E. Let's just talk about inclusion, which by the way is an awesome thing. It's an excellent thing. But I am concerned that if we just focus on inclusion and forget the D and the E, then it's not to me anyway. That's not what the practice of DEI is about. Well, that's an interesting point of view because I tell a story about the year I entered the accounting profession I went to work for <laughs> a major CPA firm, and I was the only African-American, the only person of color, really, in a firm that had 195 professionals in Philadelphia. And I was one of maybe 10 Black CPAs in all of Philadelphia. And so, you know, you go into this place and you first off are wondering, I don't know how in the world I got hired because... There's no one else around here like me. But then when you get in there, you understand, oh, maybe they didn't really want to hire me because they're not putting me on any jobs. Right. They're not really giving me any. I'm not really included in anything substantively. And the activities that they have are things that, you know, not necessarily going to help me. I mean, I was a really good member of their basketball team. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't too good at the golf thing, you know, at the time. And. And so even the social events at the time weren't things I was all that interested in. They would go out drinking and all this stuff. I wasn't interested in all that. So I wasn't really being included. I'm thinking they had some idea that it would be good for them to have at least one person of diverse background. Mm -hmm. But as far as equity and inclusion, eh, not so much, right? Today, I think the conversation is more around equity. Mm -hmm. But, you know, back then we were coming off of affirmative action. Mm -hmm. We were just beginning to get out of that. In the 70s, 
we saw an explosion in the 60s and 70s where companies just opened the door because you could have quotas. Right. And I always say companies are very good at that. Mm -hmm. When you tell a CEO, here's a number you have to hit. Right. They will hit that number and keep moving. Now, if you can fit into their culture and succeed, more power to you. But they weren't going to change anything to make it easier for you. Correct. Right? Yep, yep, yeah. And so um, the, the idea of affirmative action gave people opportunity. Right. It didn't really do a whole lot to include them. And I can even think about my college. When I came to my college, Irwin, <laughs> there was a boatload of us that were let in from the African-American community. And you know what happened after the first semester, half of us were gone. Mm, mm, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, because they didn't do anything to kind of help people who were from these backgrounds right. fit in and succeed. So I, I guess what I'm saying is, if you go backwards to affirmative action, which I'm so glad you brought up, it gave people opportunity and a lot of people were able to succeed mm-hmm. because of that. Many of whom were highly qualified and went on to have great mm-hmm. careers and would have made it in any environment. And then there were normal people mm. who should have been given more opportunity, but weren't because the organization wasn't willing to meet them where they were. Mm-hmm. I'm hoping that that is that practice will change today, but it's harder, right? It's harder for a company that was that can only focus that or had a focus on numbers to now say, oh, it's not just about the numbers. It's about the quality of the experience that we're creating for people that we bring in. Right. How do we even measure that? What's your thought about how we go about helping institutions particularly achieve that quality? Mm-hmm that they can actually get out of the people they're bringing in what they need from them. Right. I mean, I think that's where the E and the I comes in, right? So definitely treating folks equitably because, okay, let's go back. It's great, well, and good if your organization is bringing in a more diverse group. But Mike, if if you even achieve to do that, right? Because even there, so that's another thing. But let's just say you do get a diverse group. Right. But are you able to keep them in? Right. Right. Are we, I mean, there, there are studies with black leaders of nonprofits who don't last long, right? Because, okay, great. We've opened the doors. We've given them a seat at the table, as it were. But is it a, a comfortable seat? Am I the only one who looks like me? Yeah. Am I given the same opportunity? So I think what organizations need to do is to go beyond just Exactly, just looking at the numbers. So there's that too, right? Just because for some, that's what I mean about disaggregating the D and the E and the I. Yeah. Because for some corporations, for profits and nonprofits, it stops at the D. And then we wonder, like, oh my gosh, why are our leaders of color leaving? Or worse, a lot of mid level and other, you know, and, and uh, frontline staff are leaving right and left. And then, but some folks will just say, well, I've done my job. I mean, hey, clearly we can't keep them, but no. And then I think that's where organizational culture comes in. And so it's everything from, I went back to policies, procedures, and practices. What do you have in place, right? So an organizational culture, chances are, reflect the dominant culture, right? Everything from how you speak, how you dress, how, you know, we talk about hair, right? And the BIPOC community, that's just an example. So the reality is most organization, organizational cultures track with the dominant culture. Yeah. So if you've got folks, yes, you've welcomed them in or at least opened the doors for them. But if they don't feel welcome, number one. And then there are also the practical things. Like that's why I think one practice that's very important for anyone who's serious about this work is not only to count how many people you brought in, but okay, how long do they stay? How long before they're promoted, et cetera, et cetera. You, there are so many metrics. Like there's a whole yeah. lot of metrics. Uh, I'm, as you know, I'm a very data-driven guy. And the metrics are out there, right? And if people are really serious, then you will track beyond just the D. Because even the E and the I, there are metrics for that. Now, granted, they don't, might not be totally quantitative. They might be qualitative. It's perception, right? So... If an organization is serious about this work, then they will track not just the numbers. And I think that's the problem because people will just focus. We have X number of women, Y number of people of color, and that's it. 
but what about how many do you retain? How many do you promote? How many are in leadership positions? How do people perceive? Because here's the thing. I've seen this in a number of organizations. Well, yeah, heck yeah, we're really diverse. But when, but what's, but why is it when you've got climate surveys or attitudinal surveys of members of this organization, there's still some discontent, right? There's still a perception that we're not treated equitably or inclusively is that a word <laughs> or it's not an inclusive culture so anyway so it's a it is work you know i'll tell you something I, i'll never forget a few years back even before 2020 and i was teaching the ethics course that we teach here at columbia you, you may recall and i recall this one student in the ethics class and i was just talking about diversity you know how to do this work uh properly if you will and a student who comes from a business background and that's his experience. You know, it's for profits. It's maximizing the profit and all that, blah, 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 or minimizing cost. So he goes, but yeah, but professor, that costs. I go, yes, it does. It costs. You know, I mean, DEI is not cheap. It does have a cost. And the, But here's the thing, though. Studies have already shown that the ROI, if you are going to talk in business speak, your return on investment will pay off. And we're not just talking about reputation. We're talking about productivity of your folks, you know, and all that. So, but yeah, there are costs to doing this work. An actual, <laughs> you know, a line item cost. Like for me, so for instance, one question, one thing I love is whenever, you know, people go, I'm going to do this, whatever. Aside from asking, what do you understand by DEI? Is it actually go, so show me the money if I can borrow that phrase, right? Because, yeah, is there a separate line item in your budget for DEI work? Or is it folded in somewhere? Because that, for me, as we both know, doesn't matter what type of organization it is, the commitment, that's what, another thing about budgets, it actually reveals your organization's commitment to you name it. Yeah. So for me, if an organization comes to me and you know, wants to talk to me about this or consult about it, first, after asking, what is your understanding of this? Then I ask, how committed are you? In other words, how much are you willing to invest? And now it's time for our giving tips segment with Bennett Weiner, one of the world's most renowned experts on charity accountability and the COO of the BBB Wise Giving Alliance. When BBB Wise Giving Alliance evaluates charities in relation to our 20 standards, one of the areas that we look into is charity finances. And in terms of the documents that we use in reviewing this particular area, we generally lean on the audited financial statements of the organization as opposed to the IRS Form 990. Now, the IRS Form 990, many of you know, is the government form that a charity annually files with the IRS that shows its total revenues and how it spent it and so forth. The audited financial statements, on the other hand, is a document that is completed by an outside accounting firm, and it's prepared in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles, which are the standards established in the U.S. by the Financial Accounting Standards Board. Overall, we believe the audited financial statements are a more reliable resource on the charity's financials. First, based on the GAAP activity, that GAAP must be followed, but also it includes certain information that you wouldn't see in the 990. For example, if there were some unrealized gains or losses on investments for a charity, you can't show that in the 990 as part of revenue, but in the audit report, it would. In addition, if the charity has close financial ties with another organization and a close governing structure, they may be required to combine their financial statements, and then the audit report would show a better financial picture of what the organization's true total resources are and how they were spent. So in general, we believe the audit financial statements is more valuable in our evaluations of charities, and that's why we look for it for those charities that bring in a million or more in total revenue. So here's another one for you, Erin. If you look at almost any organization, especially one that's diverse, yeah. there are going to be people across the spectrum of opinions about this, right? Some people in the organization are going to be like, what is this DEI stuff? Can't we just do our jobs and no one's offending anyone. Everybody has the same opportunity to succeed here. 
And yet there are going to be people who don't see it that way. And the ones who are probably less likely to appreciate the DEI efforts may not be the ones speaking up for fear of retribution or whatever, but may be quietly undermining it. How do we deal with that? Well, absolutely. First of all, it's recognizing that, right? Recognizing the reality that there will be folks in your organization who may not get this DEI thing, who might actually be opposed to it and might actually sabotage your efforts, right? And in a way, I'd say those are the most, if you will, dangerous personalities because at, at best, they just won't act on it. At worst, they might actually do something against your program. So I'd rather actually have folks who are very vocal about what they're saying, which brings to, ironically, one of the main uh, practices of DEI is a psychologically safe organization or space where everybody uh, feels free to speak up, to speak their mind, give their opinion without fear of retribution of whatever sorts. So that doesn't only mean BIPOC folks, gay folks, or women or what. It actually means even conservative folks. How safe is your space? Because bear in mind, DEI is really for everyone. Right. So that includes those because in a lot, particularly for those of us in the more liberal areas of the country. Right. The minorities are actually the conservatives. Frankly, as a, a diversity officer here at Columbia, which is a place of higher ed and which fact of the matter is tends to be more liberal. I one of the first things that crossed my mind is like, how what about our conservative students, our conservative faculty, our conservative conservative staff? Do they feel included? Now, I don't have a straight answer for that because it's how do you figure out, right? They might not feel safe talking about that. So I think back to your original question, I think this is where a lot of education is needed. I wanted, I've said this out loud, I'll say this on the record that we could never change hearts and minds. It's not the job of an organization, of management, much less of the country, right? Because guess what? It's going to work against you. There have been studies a lot around trainings and workshops, and no surprise, if it's mandatory, it ain't going to work, right? That said, I'd rather that if, if one were to work in an organizational culture is to educate folks, like why are we doing this, right? And going beyond, beyond the business case. Because that's already been established. But to actually tell people, I think, is if to find a way to make people understand that this is not a zero-sum game where as BIPOC or women or LGBTQ folks, whatever, take away from someone else. No, it's not. There's in room, so not to come from a place of scarcity, but one more of, you know, abundance, which... So it's how to communicate that. Another way is for people to understand that there's actually a bigger cause here. That, hey, you who might feel that, let's just say it, a cisgender white man might feel left out, but actually make this gentleman understand you have a part in this. And actually it makes for a better organization and ultimately for a better society. Now that that's where the, I guess time and skill, but you can't force it on folks. But I think it's best that education ultimately it's always about education, but it's also having safe spaces to talk about this. And that's one and one thing that actually I'm concerned about right now because in our country, and particularly it's just gotten worse and worse. As we've had these conversations before, where we're all in our silos and nobody's talking to each other, and if there's any exchange, it's all shouting at each other. And it it's it it concerns me because and what what's sort of ironic paradoxical I don't know what word to use is that a vast majority of Americans are in the middle. Most of us are in the middle where we're not exactly like the loud ones at the ends, but we're not talking to each other. You name it, whatever issue it is, right? So yeah, no, no, I I completely agree that our inability to communicate across difference yeah. is really hurting our country. And it's hurting us from a productivity standpoint. I'm yes. convinced of that. Because if, for instance, I should be doing business with you, but I find out that you are of, let's say, a political ideology that I disagree with, I'm going to be more reluctant to do that yes. because maybe I don't know how to reach you or maybe you're going to say something that I feel offended about. Right. 
how do we even begin to deal with that? This is not how it should be, in my opinion. Now, it, it, well, but it is, right? And yeah. I think, or it depends on who are you, right? You know, in our ethics framework, like, are you if are you the head of this organization? And because there's a difference between one's personal opinion, right? Or you know, like I might say, I'm not going to deal with that kind of person or that kind of person, but as a representative of, of an organization, especially as the leader of an organization, you have to think beyond of whatever your own thoughts are or feelings and proclivities or what have you, but you have to think about the organization. And, and I'm thinking of risk management. So in this case, while I agree that we should look beyond, that's where it depends, right? So no. for instance, if if you're a nonprofit that really wants to, that does a lot of work with BIPOC folks, right? And then suddenly here comes, whether it's actually just a supplier where you're buying supplies from or a funder, but you know that the owner or they're known to be more conservative or worse in terms of race issues. That's where I would actually argue, well, then that's where you have to do some thinking, right? Because as the leader of the organization, how will this look? right? Not just to your stakeholders, but even your own staff. I've seen this, uh, sadly, with what's going on right now, like whole conflict in the Middle East, right? And as you, as we both know, our country is divided us with everything on both sides, where it's either, again, this or that, you're, I'm for this side or that side. And I've seen this even with nonprofits now, where I won't, like one in particular, and I, I, I will refrain from naming it, is now facing this dilemma because most of the stakeholders are primarily backed by POC. But then they're not happy that the organization has not said anything about the conflict in the Middle East. Yeah. You know, the, these are the realities, right? And in higher, higher ed, I need not <laughs> rehash. You know, we're in the news every day. Yeah. Right. So, but anyway, but back to leading and management, I, I think ultimately that's where you have to weigh things and, but try to act with integrity. Right. Anyway. So. No, no. Well, I, I wanted to also just put out that if you're inside of one of these organizations and you are, let's say a person from a historically disadvantaged background, the challenge has, in, has historically been you don't speak up for fear that Correct. the dominant culture will crush you. Right. Now it's almost that we have the opposite going on because we've encouraged more openness on the part of the culture that has been, let's say, oppressed. Mm -hmm. Now we have the other side not wanting to communicate, even though they're still the dominant culture. And sure. part of me asked the question, sure. should we feel bad about that? I don't know if we should. <laughs> I mean, you know, I guess to some extent we should not maybe not feel bad. Maybe we should be saying that you have had your chance to talk. Correct. You continue to have your chance to talk. Right. Why don't you want to talk? And if you don't want to talk, then we're just going to assume everything's right. I, I mean, I don't know if that's the right way to think about this, but it's a way of thinking about it because for too long, people have sort of not had the opportunity to speak up and speak out. And there's been a lot of risk associated with them doing that. Mm -hmm. Now we're saying there's no risk. Say what you have to say or less risk. I won't say no risk. There's less risk. I was about to say, yeah. But now we're not hearing from the other side. And I think we have to be able to hear from both sides if we're going to make progress. Agreed. But I would also add to that a, a bit of nuance that it depends on where you are yeah. in this country, right? So again, on the coast, the east and the west coast and other more liberal areas, yes, it might be that formerly BIPOC folks, queer folks or what have you now have the voice. And if you will, the white males don't. But we know full well, you go to Florida, you go to Texas, everywhere. It's not that safe. Right. We, we hear about. So, A, it depends on that. But I totally agree that we have to have a figure out a way where all voices are heard. Right. And I'm not saying that we privilege one group over, over another. Right. Not at all. But that's tricky. Right. And yeah. I think this this in a way leads us to this whole concept of cancel culture. Yeah. Right. Because 
here's the thing. I, I'll just share this. As someone in higher ed, and I don't think I'm the only one, who is worried about being canceled. <laughs> wow. <laughs> right? And it depends, again, where you are. It doesn't matter. But now in higher ed, unless you have tenure, <laughs> forget <laughs> about it. Right? I mean, and so it's a tough situation. And then, anyway, I know we're digressing here, but this whole cancel culture is not the answer. I'm all for holding people accountable. Absolutely. I'm all for calling out. If calling out means educating folks and telling them, okay, what's wrong with it? And maybe calling out is not the way to say it. Young ones are saying calling in, right? I'm <laughs> learning. Again, it's going back to, we just have to have these conversations, difficult conversations, yeah, not easy, uncomfortable conversations. But the problem is, and this goes, it doesn't matter both right and left, depending on where you sit in this country, because one group, either the more liberal ones or the conservative in power, is that those who who are on the, if you will, the losing end, just, you know, zip their mouths and not say anything. Yeah. So right. it's not so, helping. So let me ask you, Erwin, do, should we all take a, a course or something in how to communicate or have difficult conversations? I think it would be helpful. Absolutely. There are, there are a number of great, yes. But I think at the personal level, though, like we might take it. Yeah. I know that I've taken some and as, as part of my job, I had to, right? But also we know we're, we're both professors. So we, we've learned to try to have different conversations. Right. But the question is what happens if the person you're talking to is not trained as such, right? So right. yes, in ideal world, let's all, but I think what's really needed here, if possible, is a for each one of us individually Let's just put aside all our identities, all our group markings, and just as individuals, stop and pause and really, really get in touch with what are our core values? What are our, and guess what? We probably all share the same, most of us anyway, because I really believe most of us at the end of the day just want to lead happy lives, make sure our families are secure and provided for. But I think the danger comes when we suddenly become too tribal. And we suddenly identify too much with our group, which I get why. I understand why. But I think so for me, yes, of course, uh, there's so many, you know, trainings and workshops that are offered. But that even there are actually scientific studies, social science that shows that the effect doesn't last long because you actually have to do it again and again and again. So the work has to be individual. We have to work on ourselves. And really, like, what are we about? You know, and try to just get in touch with the fact that we're all humans here, <laughs> and we all actually want the same thing. Yeah. Uh, well, Erwin, look, I appreciate you stepping in, uh, stopping by, and being on the show. Uh, you've been listening to Erwin De Leon, who is the Chief Diversity Officer at the Columbia University School of Professional Studies Nonprofit Management Program, he's, where he teaches, and he's just a wealth of knowledge. And it's been great to have him as an advisor and friend. And Erwin, I'm going to give you just the last note here to just tell us what should we be thinking about as we build our organizations to become more diverse and inclusive? And is there any hope for the nonprofit sector to actually lead? I actually expect the nonprofit sector to lead because of the fact that we are mission driven and that I think most nonprofits really put people first, right? The people we serve. And I think where the difference will is with how do we treat the people in our organizations? And I really believe that if we see each member of our organization as an individual and treat them properly, correctly, equitably as an individual, then we'll be practicing DEI without knowing it. DEI without knowing it. That's a, that's a great thing. It's just treating people as we should. But that's the last thing. I mean, as you know full well, we, we might be doing great stuff in the world, but if we're not living, doing that to our own people, then there's a problem. Well, listen, this is a weekly podcast. You've been listening to it, the Heart of Giving podcast. And we come on every week on Tuesday with a new episode. So if you're listening for the first time, I hope you will subscribe to the show so you can get all the episodes when they come out. And if you want to support the show, we would be honored to receive a, a gift from you. 
you can go to give.org, G-I-V-E dot O-R-G, and we'll put that money to great use. Thank you for listening. You've just listened to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor. Be sure to tune in next time for a brand new episode. To listen to our other interviews, visit heartgiving.podbean.com. That's heartgiving.podbean.com. Subscribe to our show on major podcast platforms. The thoughts and opinions expressed on this podcast are the views and opinions of the guests, not those of the BBB Wise Giving Alliance or program affiliates. This podcast is for information and educational purposes only and is copyrighted with all rights reserved. This podcast is protected by Podbean's Terms of Service.